Good. So, yeah, questions on easy build. We handle that. So the the last part of the workshop is um, an introduction to the easy project. Um, and that has sort of evolved from the easy build community, not directly, but there's lots of people involved with easy build also involved in the easy project. This is really my favorite cartoon. So this shows we have some very good ideas here on what we could do in the easy project, but we have a day job and we need to keep the researchers happy with what we currently have. So we're like, we're almost too busy using square wheels, even though we, we know that there are proper wheels ahead of us, but okay. So this is, let's say not progressing as fast as we would like it to, um, but we are actively working on it and we're, we are making progress. So what is easy? Easy is short for the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations. Uh, we pronounce it as easy, that's not an accident. There's a clear link with easy build um, and things are, this is supposed to make things easy, right? So that's why we gamed that a bit. The, the European part, we often get questions on. So if I'm not in Europe, does that mean I cannot join? Also here in the UK, that's a relevant question. <laughs> um, we could change that first E to uh, another word that starts with an E. Uh, so we're, and we actually considered that at some point. Um, it's really just to, to game it and to have a, a project name that sounds like easy. Um, it was also a done deliberately to some extent to get some European funding for this, which eventually worked out. So um, there are some reasons why we have the European in there, but there's definitely no limitation in terms of countries who can join or people who can use it. It's an it's an, an open source project, just like easy with this. Um, what we want to do here is we want to build, work together to build a shared repository of scientific software that's optimized, like EasyBuild does, optimized for specific hosts. And it's a repository of installations itself. And that's an important detail. We're not doing software packages like RPMs. We're not doing recipes like easy config files that you don't have, then have to install themselves. We're sharing the installations themselves. And that's an important detail. And we will show this when we go through the demos and the actual structure of um, how this is organized, what that means. Um, the main goal we have for this is avoiding duplicate work. So even if people work together on easy build, you still run into weird issues that you only see on your system. You have to figure those out. Um, so even if somebody already wrote an easy config file that worked for them, um, you'll still have to go through that installation, which may take time and it may fail because of specifics of your um, operating system or your setup. And that's what we want to get rid of. We want to start working together on the software stack itself rather than tools um, to get that in place. Um, we also see this as a uniform way to providing software to users. So right now, even if the software is installed with EasyBuild across multiple systems, things are going to look a bit different. Maybe the module naming scheme is a bit different. The location where the modules are installed are different. Some systems are set up where the modules are available to use and to load directly. So in some other systems, you have to do a module use first. And maybe they're using a hierarchical module naming scheme and you're not. So things get confusing and things are a little bit different and different enough that the researchers get confused. If we have a shared repository, which you can use in multiple locations, it looks the same everywhere. So that's already a big hurdle that's removed for the researchers. The goal of this project, and that's a very ambitious goal, we fully realize that, is that the installations we provide should work on any Linux operating system, regardless of whether it's Ubuntu or Red Hat or whatever other variant or whatever version it is. We shouldn't really care um, about that. Um, it also works in, in WSL, so the Windows subsystem for Linux. You can play with those installations there as well, which is really just another Linux environment. It's like a VM you're in. Um, and we're, we're also considering supporting macOS. So that's different enough. That's going to be another big effort. Right now, we're not working on this. But the door is open to also start doing this um, and make that possible. So the goal is really to give you a set of software installations that work on your laptop, on your personal computer at work, to an HPC cluster, and even in the cloud, AWS, Azure, Oracle, Google, whatever you want to use, it should work there as well. Um, so that's mostly in terms of operating system, but also it should work on different types of CPUs, old generations of Intel, new generations of Intel, AMD, also ARM CPUs. Um, 
power. We're currently still playing a bit with power nine, but we'll, we'll stop doing that because that's sort of a dead end. But in the future, Risk Five is coming up as well as, a, as another CPU um, family, let's say, and we want to add support for that as well. So lots of operating systems, lots of different types of CPUs, and then we're not looking yet at interconnect, InfiniBand, or um, in the cloud, EFA and AWS, for example. Um, different generations of NVIDIA GPUs, but also AMD GPUs, Intel GPUs. Ideally, we want to support all of those as well. And that's very ambitious, but because we're working together and we're sharing the software installations themselves, we believe that actually becomes feasible. Um, and we'll see uh, how far we get with that in the next couple of years. So the focus of the project is very much on performance, where we want um, to use this for scientific software that's used on HPC systems. So performance is a very important aspect here. We'll have to automate as much as we can to make this feasible. So if we'll have um, people manually building software for these all these types of uh, system architectures, that's not going to work. So that needs to be fully automated. Uh, we want to also make sure that not just the installation work, but that works, that, but that the software actually runs and runs well, so that it functionally works, that it performs well. So we're going to be testing all of these things. And we'll have to collaborate together to make this possible. So there's a website, there's documentation on GitHub, um, and I'll show you the, the pilot setup, the proof of concept setup we have for this and explain how this works. Um, this is just to zoom in on, on performance. I probably don't need to explain this in detail here, but this gives you an idea of what the impact may be if you're not being careful uh, about uh, the binary that you're running on a very capable system. So this graph shows you the performance that you get for Gromax, um, one of the, the praise benchmark inputs for Gromax. Um, all the benchmarks or all these tests are run on the same system, an Intel Cascade Lake system. And all we're really doing here is using a different binary for the exact same version of Gromax. So we didn't touch the code at all. We're just basically building this with different compiler options and seeing how, how it performs different. Um, if you build it with only SSC2 instructions, so it runs anywhere on any modern x86 hardware, we call it the generic binary. You get a performance of about, let's say, one um, simulated nanosecond per day. So that's a measure of how fast the, the simulation is. The larger that value, the better the performance is. If you start using AVX instructions as well in your binary, that goes up. And to the very end, we also use AVX 512 instructions, which are supported by Intel Cascade Lake, and then you get way better performance. So performance actually goes up, but let's say like 70% by only using proper vector instructions for, for the binary. So the impact can be quite big. And Gromax is probably a pretty extreme example of that. Maybe we're more talking 10, 20%, but that's still significant, right? That could still make a big difference. So that's a very important uh, point. So what do we have as major goals in the EASY project? Well, first of all, we want to avoid duplicate work. Um, and not only for the people who are installing the software, the HPC support teams, but also for the researchers. So we don't want to, to relearn um, the software stack when they jump from one system to another. Ideally, they can use the same um, the same software installations everywhere. Um, tools like EasyBuild and SPAC already do some of that, but they're not really sufficient because, okay, we're automating the installation procedure. And if it works for you, that's good, but you're still doing an installation. And if it doesn't work, you'll still have to figure out why it doesn't work for you and try and fix that. So there's still lots of duplicate work there. So we want to go way beyond just sharing the build recipes. We want to go to, towards sharing the software installations, the actual binaries themselves. Um, we want to build a uniform software stack that runs, let's say, anywhere. So regardless if you're running in the cloud or running on your laptop or running on an HPC cluster, you're basically using the same installations. It looks the same, it feels the same, you know how it works and you don't need to lose time um, to see how, how, uh, how all of that works. Um, so mobility of compute is sometime, sometimes that you often hear about when, when talking about containers and Conda. So you're just taking your software with you. We're doing sort of that as well. It's more like the software follows you um, automatically, um, and we do it in a way that we're aware of this this performance issue. Which in containers, it's usually just it. People ignore this silently, just run one binary everywhere, and assume that will be okay. Well, it's often not, and 
Uh, so you shouldn't be cutting that corner. And we have a better way of dealing with that. Um, if we manage to do this, this will help with HPC training. We can uh, spin up a virtual uh, slurm cluster in the cloud, train the scientists on this, make sure their LAMP software, for example, is there, they can play with it. And then if, the, then if they can get home, if they also have access to easy, they get the exact same installations on their laptop. If they move to their um, institute cluster, they can also have the same binaries there and they basically know how things work. So making the jump from being trained to actually using it after the training becomes a lot, uh, a lot smaller. Uh, we think this can also help with developers of scientific software. So um, let's say OpenFOAM as an example. Um, the OpenFOAM developers probably know their own code base very well, but they need a bunch of dependencies and they don't want to go through the pain of having to install those dependencies or having to figure out how to build different versions of GCC or CLang so they can experiment with all these compilers. Ideally, these things are just available somewhere for them to experiment with. Um, and also in um, in CI environments like GitHub Actions, for example, uh, they can get easy access to a wide variety of compilers there. It's probably going to help them to also test their code with those compilers. So there's lots of uh, uh, things that become possible if you could get this to work. All right, so how is this project organized? It's really a layered um, structure. Uh, three main layers, a file system layer, a compatibility layer, and a software layer. Um, the file system layer is what's responsible for distributing the software installations we provide. And for this, we rely on an existing um, project that was created at CERN, which is called CERN VM FS, CERN VM file system. Um, this was built exactly to distribute large amounts of software across the world in a very easy way. And I'll explain what this does. It's a, it's a bit difficult to grasp what it's actually doing because it's so different from um, other types of distributing software like building packages or, or downloading container images. Uh, but it is a very powerful concept. And we're very thankful that the, uh, the CERN developers, the, the people at CERN who developed this, um, have been sharing this as an open source project. The middle layer, the compatibility layer, is what we need to shield, shield ourselves from the host operating system. So what we're basically doing there is building our own mini Linux environment. So we don't have to rely anymore on what the host operating system provides. The main part in there is glibc. So we have our own glibc in there. And then whenever we're running on Ubuntu or, or Fedora or uh, CentOS Linux, we don't really care because we're not, we're not going to use the glibc in there or any of the other libraries to the extent that we can avoid that. There are technical reasons that we sometimes can't uh, InfiniBand drivers, GPU drivers, those will still need to come from the host because there's too much, uh, they're too tied to the kernel um, so that we cannot avoid. But we'll have ways of detecting what's there and if needed, installing missing stuff. And we're playing with that actively already. So that's still feasible. Um, on top of our compat layer, we'll be installing the actual scientific applications, OpenFOAM, TensorFlow, all these things. Um, they will link to the libraries in the compatibility layer, and that way they can run anywhere because we're only relying on the host for the kernel, essentially, and whatever kernel drivers we cannot avoid. And that works, and that works well. Uh, so this software layer is being installed with EasyBuild today. There's actually nothing specific in here that requires EasyBuild. We could use SPAC or other installation tools in this top layer as well, as long as we can make sure that the, whatever is being built in here links directly to the compatibility layer and not to the host. So we cannot pick up anything from the host, otherwise it won't work as expected. Next to EasyBuild, we're using LMOD, so we're, we're generating mod environment modules along for these installations, so you can pick them up. Now we're using an extra library here called ArchPack, which does detection of what type of CPU you have. So not only is it x86 or ARM, but also is it Intel, Intel or AMD and which generation of Intel or AMD is it? Is it one that perform, uh, that supports AVX2 or AVX512 instructions or not? So this tiny library basically tells us what type of CPU we, we have. And based on that, we can pick installations that are optimized for that type of CPU. And the whole um, software layer is structured in such a way that this becomes very clear that this is happening. I'll, I'll show how this works. Um, so that's the three main layers. We're also actively playing with Reframe for testing. So Reframe is a 
software testing regression testing tool uh, created at CSCS in Switzerland. Um, like I said, we want to do a very good job at not only providing those installations, but make sure they work. So we're going to be testing those installations in Ubuntu, in CentOS, on ARM, on Intel, on AMD, and make sure that that all works. I will we'll do functional uh, tests to make sure it runs, but also performance tests to make sure it performs well so that we're on the right end of that Gromax uh, benchmark plot. Um, we're looking at, today we're looking at Intel, AMD, ARM, and Power9. Power9 is a dead end. We'll, we'll stop wasting time on that. But we will very soon start looking at Risk Five as well. So there's there's big European projects that are actively looking into building um, accelerators that use the Risk Five instruction set, but also very capable CPUs that use that use Risk Five. So in let's say five years from now, these will be very relevant, um, and we want to be ready for that. So when when the capable CPUs are there, we'll basically have the software to run on them, which is Usually the other way around happens. The CPUs are there and then people start figuring out how to build for it. We can actually prepare for that already and hit the ground running as soon as let's say the first risk five um, supercomputer is there. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Um, let's see, how should I continue? I'll first explain a bit more what the file system layer does. So that's how we distribute um, the software that we provide in the easy project. Um, this is basically what, what CERN VMFS does. So this is not something we created, but it, it's to give you some idea what, what CERN VMFS provides us. So CERN VMFS allows you to build a file system, something like NFS that you can mount somewhere. Uh, and it's always going to be read only for the clients. So the people who use the file system cannot make any changes at all in the file system. They can only consume what is there. Um, and it's mostly targeted towards software installations. Some people use it to distribute data files, big data sets as well. That also works. What happens is you're um, creating an, what's called a CVMFS repository, so a, a file system in a central location, a central server, which is called a Stratum Zero. Um, and you make sure there are enough mirrors of that Stratum Zero that have a full copy of the software stack available and they sync automatically with the Stratum Zero. So whenever software is being added to the repository, this can only be done here centrally, and it just syncs up to everything um, around the world. You typically have multiple of these mirror servers to make it redundant. If this guy dies, if everything is fine because these all have a copy. And as long as there's one mirror server somewhere, you can still continue and consume um, those software installations and use them. In here, you could have an we eventually will have thousands of installations. Um, these have a full copy of that. And when you as a friendly user here start um, using that software, for example, on an HPC cluster or on your local laptop or in the cloud, um, you'll basically be mounting from one of these mirror servers. You'll, you're talking to this guy. And if you fire up TensorFlow, um, you're here from a CVMFS point of view, you're a client computer. Um, if you fire up TensorFlow, it's going to check, CVMFS is going to check in your local cache, do I have that TensorFlow binary already? I don't, okay. So I'll ask here in this caching layer, this proxy cache um, or squid cache, um, is TensorFlow here already? If not, it's going to ask the mirror server, please give me the TensorFlow binary. It's going to come back here. It's going to be copied into your cache. You have the binary and you can run it. Uh, that binary is probably going to need libraries. So the same story happens for the libraries. So what's, what's basically happening, um, very simplified, is that you're streaming your software installations. It's like Netflix when you say, oh, let's, tonight let's watch this movie. You click the movie and it starts quickly downloading the first part of that movie so you can get started. It's the same thing here when you start running TensorFlow. It says, oh, oh I don't have that binary. I have to download it. It downloads it to your cache. You can run that binary. And there's a small startup delay, of course, because it has to do that. Um, but the next time is going to be very quick because I have a local, a local copy of that uh, in there. Um, so that's one thing. You have this streaming, um, streaming idea, and it's fully transparent to the end user. So if they start typing module avail, what is there? Uh, module avail means I need to know what's in that, in that directory. It will copy the metadata for that directory, which is very quick. 
um, it lo you're loading the TensorFlow module. Oh, it needs that module file. It's going to download that. So all of this happens behind the scenes, and it feels like everything is local, maybe with a small delay the first time you hit something. Um, but other than that, you can't really tell that it's it's all streaming in, in, in the background. So CVMFS hides this all from you. Um, and thanks to these multiple caching levels, you have cache here, you have a cache here, which could be in the network of your HPC cluster. You could even have your own full mirror server next to your HPC cluster to make sure to you reduce that latency for downloading um, stuff. Everything is here. Even if this guy dies, it will just automatically migrate to the other one uh, to download stuff from there. So as long as there's one somewhere around the world, everything will nicely keep working. If this guy dies, no problem. For a couple of hours, we cannot add new software, but everything else has a full copy, so it's all good. So this it's all like this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network for streaming um, your software. The big advantage is wherever you are, uh, in here, in the cloud, on your laptop, as long as you mount this um, easy repository, the serving MFS repository, you're getting the same software installations everywhere. So that's how we distribute stuff. But that's not enough because if you build a binary for me on Ubuntu and I'm on CentOS, it's hopeless, right? There's just no way that's going to work. So that's why we need the second step, the second layer. This is the compatibility layer. Um, we construct this with Gen2 prefix. So Gen2 is a um, Linux distribution where you typically build everything from source. Um, Gentoo has a sub project called Prefix because you can in install your own Linux distribution in a prefix, in an installation directory that you choose yourself. When you're using CVMFS, everything has to go into slash CVMFS. So we need to be able to build binaries that work in that prefix. That's why we use Gentoo Prefix for this. Uh, again, the biggest one here is glibc. There's other libraries as well. Um, to, to figure out uh, usernames and things like this. Um, but it's pretty, pretty minimal. So only the stuff that we really need is there. Um, so we'll, co we'll construct the compatibility layer once for every CPU family we support. Once for ARM, once for x86, for now, once for power as well, and eventually one for RISC-V, 64-bit as well. So you basically have four mini Linux installations that are included in your uh, CVMFS repository. So that way we, we shield ourselves from the operating system and we, we can build a binary in here that works on Ubuntu or CentOS or SUSE or WSL, whatever, any Linux distribution. So it looks like this in terms of the structure. Um, all CVMFS repositories are in slash CVMFS. Pilot easyhpc.org is the name of our easy repository. In there, we have a couple of versions because over time, we'll actually do versioning across the compatibility layer as well. Every now and then, we will rebuild this Linux environment to get a new glibc version, maybe once a year or once every two years, and whatever makes sense. And in there, we have a directory for Linux because eventually we plan to support macOS as well. And we have a subdirectory for the CPU family uh, that you're using. I can show this interactively as well to get a better view uh, on what this does. And then on top of this, we have the software layer. So this is where EasyBuild and LMOD kicks in, which we've been playing with for, uh, let's say, the last day. Uh, so in here, we will build our big scientific applications and all those dependencies that it needs. Um, and they will link to the compatibility layer, glibc, and whatever other libraries not to the libraries provided by the host OS. And that way they will work um, as long as that compatibility layer is available. We're currently in using EasyBuild for those installations. We could be using other tools as well. So anything that we can control to only use stuff from the compat layer works. Spec, I think today cannot do this, but it could be enhanced to also make sure it doesn't go outside of this little box that it's supposed to stick, stick into. And then ArchPack is used for detecting what type of CPU you have. A small part of that is which one of these three families are you using, but also way more specific than that. It's going to check if it's Intel and if it's an Intel Haswell or an Intel Skylake, uh, like this. So that means this software layer is not one set of installations, software installations. It's actually one set for Intel Haswell, one set for Intel Skylake, one set for AMD Rome, one set for ARM Graviton 2, which is an ARM CPU in, in AWS and so on. 
So we basically have every installation multiple times for as many CPU types as we, we need to care about. Okay, I'll get back to this later. Let me show you how what this looks like on a system where we have easy available and it is right there in our prepared environment. So if you do slash CVMFS, you can start looking into this yourself. You will find the easy repository. Right now it's a bit more messy than we would like it to. So there's an old version here uh, that dates from the time before we had a versions directory. So eventually this part is gonna disappear. In versions, we have currently two versions. This is a symlink to the other one. This is our latest version, which is getting quite old. We're actively working on a new one and we will probably ingest that uh, next week. So we've built one in April 2304, um, which is gonna be our next version. Uh, we have a latest symlink as well, which now points to uh, the 21.12. So let's just use this latest link in here. Let me do it like this. In here, you have the compatibility layer and the software layer. So the two layers that are included in our file system layer, which is CVMFS. And we have an init subdirectory as well, which has some scripts to set up your environment. Let's take a look at the compat layer first. Like I said, a subdirectory for Linux, because eventually we hope to also support macOS. And here we have three CPU types, ARM, Power, and x86. And if we look into one of them, this is where you'll see something that looks like a Linux uh, file system hierarchy. Binaries, libraries, in here, glibc is somewhere. I always forget where, here it is. So that's our, our glibc that we will be linking to uh, in the software layer. That's the compot layer. Our software layer has a very similar structure. Uh, what type of OS are we using, Linux or Mac OS? What type of CPU do we have? ARM, Power, or x86? But then here it gets a bit more fine grained. In x86, we have AMD, Intel, and generic. Generic means any x86 CPU, I don't really care. But in the Intel and the AMD directories, we get a bit more specific. So currently we have Hazel and Skylake for Intel. Um, so basically AVX2 and AVX512. And in AMD, we have Zen 2 and Zen, 2, Zen 3, so Rome and Milan. And then in here, you'll find uh, the modules and the software directories that EasyBuild produces when installing software. So you can see we have this whole structure in the repository, so that this, that's absolute madness. You would never let a researcher manage this by hand, right? They, they would never figure it out. That's where the init script comes in. So we have an init directory which has a couple of scripts. The most in, important one is our init script here. And this does some magic. This will use the ArchPack Python library to detect what type of CPU you have um, and use that to set up your environment. So if we source the script, this script is gonna change stuff in our current shell environment. We need to source it, not run it. And this is very silent. Why is it very silent? because it's probably already done. Let me do it on, this confuses me. It's supposed to give me some output. I guess it's because if you log in, it already does that by default. So let me do it on our system to show you what kind of output you should be getting. You can see it drops us in an easy, environment, but it's not really producing the output I'm expecting. There's a way to make it silent. So maybe that's enabled by default in the prepared environment. Let's do it on our system where I know it's not gonna be silent. So on our systems in Ghent, we already have the easy repository mounted, but we're not telling anyone yet. So the researchers don't really know if they would be looking for it, they can find it but we're not promoting this yet because we know it's not really, let's say, stable and reliable. So what this is doing, what this script is doing, is it's doing CPU detection using ArchPack. So, and it, it produces some output, says ArchPack says we're on an x86 CPU, AMD, 
Zen 2, so it's an AMD ROM, which matches our login nodes. So that makes sense. Using that information, it says, OK, so this is the subdirectory I'm going to use in the software layer. And it's telling you here in slash CVMFS, pilot easy, the current version of that. In the software layer, I'm going to use the Linux um, subdirectory. I'm going to use this particular subdirectory for the modules. So it's focusing in on the software that was built for AMD Rome. And it does that automatically. It adds this path to your module path. Um, it finds the Elmod configuration file for that, makes those changes in the environment, and then you're ready to go. Now, what does that mean? If I now do a module avail of, let's say, OpenFoam, I should be seeing the OpenFoam installation that's included in the Easy repository. Now, this feels a bit sluggish, right? Because at first, um, CVMFS says, OK, oh, you, need to, you need to know what's in that module's all directory. I'll have to download that metadata and, and cache it locally. Otherwise, I don't know what's there. So that's why the first time it takes a while. The second time, it should be a lot quicker. It should be, maybe not always. Um, one thing I didn't do is we're still picking up stuff from that we have installed in, in this case, in my account on the system. Even if you empty your module part before, um, you will still see the things in here in the easy repository. So right now we have three versions of OpenFoam installed in there and those should work, should work fine. So that's the, the setup that you do to get started, to get you access to those modules. And now, let me let me do an unuse of the stuff we have in my account. So I'm only really interested in the easy things like this. We have open foam, we have Gromax. I can load one of these. And again, this will make CVMFS pull in some stuff in the background. So all these latency aspects, uh, these are annoying, but you can limit the, those a lot by having a proper caching setup at your site. Right now, it's not properly set up. So that's why it's a bit slow initially, but it does work. That gives us a bunch of modules. And let's see if we're now looking which Python we are using. So the Python command has changed because there was a Python dependency loaded for God knows what here, something. Um, the Python binary we're using is one that's coming from slash CVMFS, the easy repository, and the one that's specific to AMD Zen 2 uh, that is optimal for our current CPU. So that all just works automatically. So from a researcher point of view, let's assume easy is available. It's there. All they need to do is somehow initialize their environment. Right now we have the source script and we can have better ways of doing that. So they do this. Then they can start loading modules and start doing their software. And they should work regardless of whether they're on an HPC cluster, in the cloud, on their laptop. It should just all work fine. It auto-detects what you have. If you're on a system, let's say, an Intel Cascade Lake, so we only have um, optimized installations for Haswell and Skylake currently. So if you check in here, So in the Intel directory, we have Haswell and Skylake. If you're on a Cascade Lake system, that means we're in trouble, right? Because there's no exact match. Archpec is smart enough to say, OK, if you just take the Skylake binaries, you'll be doing pretty good. So it knows what is compatible with what, and it will take the, the best possible match for your CPU, even if there's no exact match. So that should also work fine. OK. Any questions on this? Yeah, let's use the mic. So when the user's running this on a cluster, they could do the sourcing in their batch job and pull everything. Yes. Down? Right. OK, cool. Because That's the better way. Yeah. Oh, so if you do this up front, and then you submit your job with Slurm, which passes down the environment. If your login nodes are different from the cluster you're submitting to, you're in trouble. Yeah. So it's better to do this from the job script itself. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you've uh, followed a layered approach. Does that mean that you could remove the file system, for example, in future, replace it with another one, and there is that kind of thought process that yeah. things will, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah so the file system layer, we, we're deliberately not calling it CVMFS because that's just one way of distributing mm, Okay. Like what you, what you could do, and we're, we're planning to do this at least for archiving, is you could say, this whole directory, so everything that includes this particular version of Easy, I'll throw it in a container image. And then I can take that container image, jump in that container, and source from there. Now, this is going to be a pretty big container image, right? Because it's going to have AMD, Intel, ARM, power, everything. So maybe you want to zoom in a bit on something very specific, or even specific installations from there. You could throw those all in, in, in a container image, and then you don't need CVMFS at all anymore. So th there's options there, yeah. If you don't like CVMFS, you could sync everything to an NFS file system and just mount that. It will still work fine. And I also saw that there was a, a branch that bypassed all the layers that went straight up. Is that because you thought, is that because of the, yeah, in the diagram? Uh, the reframe part? Yeah, from the host OS, you go all the way up to bypassing all the layers, yeah, bypassing the compatibility and the file system. This? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's because for some things, awesome. we still need stuff from the host. Like Slurm, we're not going to give you Slurm in here anywhere. That doesn't make sense. The GPU drivers need to come from the host because they're too much tied to the kernel. Uh, your InfiniBand drivers need to come from the host. They're too tied to your hardware and the kernel. So some things need to like leak in, but it leaks in in, in a controlled way. And we take, it, we take that into account in here. So when we configure our OpenMPI library, for example, we're doing this with libraries like UCX, which, which basically also detect what you have and just use what you what's provided by the OS, and that, that works. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't mention, I should have mentioned that, is one question we, we often get, like, well, wait, this is a good idea, but is this going to work in practice? Well, yes, because Compute Canada has been doing this for five, six years. Exactly this system, this layered approach. They used to use something different than Gen2, but they have now also switched to Gen2 because it's the better option. They used to use Nix for the compat layer. But this idea of this layered approach and using CVMFS, that's basically what they do in Canada. They have one software stack that's used on all the Canadian systems, and they have a team managing that central software stack. That use, they have a mix of InfiniBand and Omnipod um, interconnects. They have a mix of Intel and AMD. They're not playing with ARM yet, but that's a detail in this setup. That's really just another CPU. You don't really care too much. So it works absolutely fine. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Another question there, York. Sure. Yeah, stupid question, but just so I'm understanding. If my operating system is quite out of date then, but a user wants a latest, greatest piece of software, this helps me get around that. Yeah. As Without long as you can get CVMFS running on it, yeah. that's enough. That's really enough, yeah. And we, we will be a bit careful here what we build because there is some things that check what kind of kernel version you have, kernel headers you have, and take that into account. That's something we'll need to keep an eye on as well. So for example, if, if we're building something, we can actively test for that. We can, we can test these installations in a CentOS 6 VM that has a very old kernel just to make sure things still work. Yeah, we can run our tests in there as well, and that's something we plan to do. Yeah, so we want to we want to um, make what we support here as broad as we possibly can. Mac OS is the annoying one because you cannot run a Linux binary on Mac OS. That doesn't work, so that creates a fork in that directory structure. And for now, we're not paying attention to that. But Gen2 prefix works on Mac OS, so we could we could build a special Gen2 prefix for Mac OS, and now we're going doing good again. We'll probably need to do it for every major Mac OS version which we don't have to do for Linux, but yeah, okay. If we have to go through that pain, we can. And if all of this is automated, that's not too big of an issue. Okay. I see it seeping in slowly, what, what this could enable, right? So that's good. Um, so let me continue. Uh, we have a paper, an easy paper, an open access paper, which explains in detail what we want to do, what all of these layers uh, mean, how they work together, how this thing is designed, uh, what kind of use cases this could enable, and so on. So this, this paper was, was written, um, it was published February 22, 
Uh, and by then, we already had our pilot repository for, for a while. We've been playing with this, so we knew technically quite well what we were getting into. It's definitely not finished work, um, but the ideas are there. One experiment we did with the 2021.12 version of Easy, which is the one I, I was showing, we have a Gromax in there. And someone ran as a regular user, so not a sysadmin, just in a regular user account, was playing with Gromax coming from Easy and comparing it with the Gromax they have installed in Yulich, which is optimized for their system and their interconnect. And he was doing a simulation up to 16,000 cores, so pretty big. And we're seeing this kind of performance. So the, the dotted line is, is ideal scaling. The black dots are what he was getting with easy with the auto detected Zen 2. So this was an AMD ROM system. Um, and the red is the performance he was getting with the optimized system installation. So higher is better. You see some of these black dots hovering above the red ones. That basically means here we're getting better performance than the system one, but that could be in the noise. So I'm not gonna say we, our installation is better. That, that could be, they're quite close to each other, but at least we're in the same ballpark, right? So, and that's already pretty impressive because our easy installation knows nothing about the system, nothing about the interconnect. It's just doing the, the detection of the CPU. OpenMPI does the detection of the interconnect and it scales and works fine. And that's, that's the main message here. The blue dots that you see are the generic binaries that we also have in Easy. So you can force Easy to use other binaries by just setting an environment variable. So you can basically disable the detection and say, run these binaries because I want to test this or see if it works. So if you force it to use the generic binaries, you're getting lower performance, of course, but it still scales. So there is a gap here in terms of performance, but it still works fine. And this was a very important result. That's why we put it in the paper. This basically shows that the idea can work and you can scale quite good. And again, I'm not going to overstate this, but this difference in performance here could be because we're using a newer glibc. So I think this was still CentOS 7 which means an old glibc, we were using a very new glibc in our compound layer, and that could give us a performance boost as well. Uh, now, again, it's close enough that it could be in the noise, but at least it's a, it's a same ballpark, definitely. All right, so what's, what's the current status of this whole idea? Um, in the tutorial page, this morning I wrote up a small history of the project. It, um, it basically started after having a meeting in Delft with some Dutch universities that invited me there to talk about EasyBuild because they had some crazy idea to work together on something big and they uh, wanted to get some funding for this and they were figuring out what to do. Um, and we had a bit of a brainstorm at the end of that meeting and the conclusion was basically, let's try and do what the Canadians do, but on a bigger scale, like make it a community project, make it a European thing even, maybe we can even get some European funding for this and, and let's, let's see if this works. Uh, that was March 2020. It was a bit of a ruse also to have lots of beers together and have the Dutch people visiting Belgium and the other way around. Then the world changed a bit, so we couldn't really travel much. Uh, but we did use that time to work out the, the proof of concept, this pilot repository, and we've been working on this um, since then. We've, we set up um, a GitHub organization on Easy called Easy. Um, we've been doing monthly meetings monthly online meetings every month since basically April 2020 to see, okay, what is the next step we should take? How can we uh, tackle the automation? Uh, who's going to work on testing? So basically get, getting ourselves organized. Writing the paper happened in, um, in that community as well. And we applied for funding on the European level as well. Um, so we ended up with a proof of concept setup where the central server is running in Groningen in the Netherlands. And we have four Stratum 1 servers, um, one in Groningen, one in Oslo in Norway, one in Azure, which is, I think, running on the East Coast in one of the data centers, and one in AWS, which is running, if I'm not mistaken, in Ireland. So they have four of these mirror servers. That means we have a relatively robust network as well. And we just wanted to see, okay, what, what happens? Like one of these mirror servers dies. It's just fully transparent. You don't really notice. We also wanted to have a good set of software in there already. For now, it's only CPU because supporting GPU is a little bit more tricky and we had to figure that out. But we have some big things in there like OpenFoam, like TensorFlow, like Gromax. You can load those modules and it should just work. Um, in terms of targets, already a good set of, uh, of CPU supported, Intel AMD, a couple of ARM ones, and 
we're still mucking about with power nine, but uh, nobody's really interested in that. And it's that's a pain to get that to work. So we're, we're going to stop doing this. The interesting news here is also um, we have pretty good contacts with, with both Microsoft and Azure. And they were basically throwing cloud credits at us. Like, whatever you need, tell us. If you want to build binaries and test stuff in different operating systems, we'll basically do that for free. And that helps us a lot we can, because we can get very easy access and very quick access to a big variety of CPUs, which is what we need to build all those binaries. Um, so that's been very, very helpful. So it, it's like, if you look at what, what we're all combining here, lots of open source packages. So all of these things basically existed already. We're making, we're puzzling them together. And the Canadians showed us how to do that. We're, we're leveraging, leveraging the cloud, um, which gives us very easy access to all, all these different CPU architectures. There's also changes in, in OpenMPI and there's this companion libraries like UCX and LibFabric that do auto detection of what kind of fabric you have. That's definitely an enabler for us as well. So it's like everything is basically there to make this possible and make it work well. And we're, we're building that puzzle and making it happen. Uh, that's basically what's going on. Um, okay, we'll do the hands-on and demo at the end um, once we have a, a good idea of what's going on. Now, one thing we're now actively working on and thinking about is we want to make this a community project. We want to basically bring the community together and work together to get installations in there. Now, how do you do that? We don't want you to come up with a binary and say, here's a binary, throw it in there, right? That doesn't... From a trust and security point of view, that's a bad idea. Um, and we also want to make sure that these things are actually working. We can test them and so on. So what we're doing is we're setting up a way that you can essentially send us a pull request. And it's a bit easy build focused, but it, it applies to other tools as well. That somehow expresses, OK, I, I would like to have OpenFoam version 10 added to easy. So if you use this easy config file, you should be able to build that binary for all these CPUs that you support. Good. So they make a pull request. And what we want to do, I'll, I'll skip ahead here a little bit because there's a lot of technical stuff here that's not that interesting. Um, yeah, this is basically what we're going for is we want you to be able to open a pull request to our software layer that says, please add open foam 10 with this tool chain. Our reviewer say, OK, that makes sense. Um, our bot will start building that on all the different CPUs we have, some in Azure, some in AWS, maybe some on-premise. Um, we'll use an, a container for this, so to isolate it from the host OS as much as we can. Uh, once we have some tests, we'll run some tests on those builds as well. If that all looks good, uh, we'll put those installations in tarball, so it's all nicely in its own installation directory, so we can make tarballs to easily ship them to other places. Um, those tarballs get uploaded to an S3 bucket, so like a, a place where we can collect stuff. They get copied over to the central server. Before we add them to the easy repository, we have another step, and this is more to keep control of what's actually going in. And this part is automated with the cron job. As soon as a new tarball appears on the Stratum 0, a pull request is opened to our staging repository that basically says, oh, this is a tarball, these are the files in there. Does that make sense to add? A human says, okay, makes sense. So they, they hit okay in that pull request. If we want to, we can have another bot here that reruns those tests. And when we're running the tests, we could run them in the build container, so the same build environment, but also in a totally different container with a different operating system. And it should still work. Uh, so it has to pass all those tests. If that all looks okay, they'll be added to the easy repository. And again, Easy repository is just a CVMFS repository. It's streaming. That means if OpenFoam 10 gets ingested here, it will automatically appear on all the clients that mount easy. They don't need to do an update at all. It's just streaming in. Like Netflix adds a new movie. You don't need to update Netflix, right? It just appears. And that's exactly what happens with all these installations as well. So we're now working on, on building this whole pipeline and automating this all and making sure this works. We've been Quite, uh, we've been quite successful at that already. We have a bot that you can tell, go ahead and build all these things and it reports back whether that worked or not, uh, but we're improving on this. The testing step is now very light to almost non-existent, but that's the next iteration. So build and deploy is our biggest goal and the test part we can, uh, we can enhance later. 
So that's really the explicit goal to make this um, a community project. That's more text, which is basically explaining what I just did. So that, that bot that I talked about is a GitHub app, which means when you open a pull request, um, an event gets sent to some Python code that can decide what to do. Um, and the event could be if the reviewer hits OK on that pull request, that's an event. And the bot could say, ah, oh, that means I can start build, start the build on all these things automatically. Um, so we're basically taking out the human as much um, as we can. We do want to still people have approved things, so we're, we're not getting anything malicious in there. Um, but that's the idea. So it's automatically building there. There's some slides on this as well that explain it step by step. So someone opens a pull request. And our, our goal there is to make this an easy stack file. So this new experimental feature in EasyBuild that just says, it now actually looks a bit different, but it basically says, I want open foam built with this tool chain and these two versions. And the reviewer says, OK. That looks good. Um, and then EasyBuild knows how to do the installation. There's an approved review. The bot says, OK, I'll submit some Slurm jobs to build all these things on different types of CPUs. That gives me tarballs for all that software. Um, the, build sa the bot says, the build's worked. Now what do I do? And the reviewer says, OK, let's go ahead and test this and make sure it works in another container, right? Maybe we're building in CentOS and testing in Ubuntu. That should work because of the compat layer. If it doesn't, we overlooked something. Um, and you could have a reframe test for that as well. Then the bot says, tests look OK to me. Now what do I do? And the human says, OK, let's, go, let's get it in there. It looks good. So this, this cycle is, um, is what we're now building. And then when the bot gets OK, it just can do all these uploads and ingestion um, so you basically add it to the easy repository and then you're done. Then everybody can start running that software. Good. Uh, like I mentioned, um, one of the goals of this initial collaboration was, this is a very good idea, but nobody has time, right? Square wheels and round wheels and all that stuff. So getting funding for this was very important. It, it took us a while. It's a lot of effort to start um, writing this idea from scratch. Um, we realize that getting funding for an, a service-like thing is not easy. It's not research. Um, so what we did is we found some researchers that actually have ambitious ideas as well that we can help. So they want to develop some software to do multi-scale modeling, like batteries and helicopters and all these complex things where they need lots of software. So it's a headache to get all of that in place and, and be able to migrate between systems very easy. So we are helping them. They're like one of their one of our demo, one of our use cases. Um, so we're, we're combining forces with, with uh, scientists from the CCAM consortium um, together with people that are already active in EASY. Uh, we're joining forces there. We have a scientific uh, use case and we are gonna help them in, in achieving that use case. So that's what the multi x scale project is about. Uh, we proposed that to as a Euro HPC center of excellence. It got accepted. And January 1st of this year, the project actually started. So we now have, let's say, more dedicated manpower to make easy uh, uh, possible. So we're going way beyond this pilot repository. The development of this bot has really sped up a lot in the last couple of months. We've made very good progress there. So we're slowly um, working our way to make easy more reliable and, and go beyond a pilot repository. We have a website as well where we're starting to make noise about the things we do. We had a kickoff meeting and so on. So demo, um, one demo I will do is I already did the one on our HPC UGAND infrastructure. What I will also do, and let's see if this works because I didn't test this at all this morning, but it should work. Um, oh, not this. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, create an empty Ubuntu VM in AWS and show you how quick it is or how quickly I can get access to easy on a totally empty system, so a blank operating system. So I'll fire up the VM somewhere in here. Launch a new instance. Been a while since I've done that. Okay. 
easy demo. Uh, let's make it Ubuntu 22.04, that makes sense. Let's make it a bit more interesting and go for ARM. Um, we should at least have some C6G, I think. Let's go for eight-ish CPUs, 16 gigabytes of memory. That should be enough for a demo. I have a key in here and finding where that key is is gonna be interesting, but I'll figure it out. Uh, and the rest is pretty standard. I'll make sure it has enough disk. So 30 gigs of disk and the rest should all be fine. So I'll fire that up. That should only take a couple of minutes. And then we can check if we can actually get easy working. Um, so that's basically the top one that I'm just setting up. Um, there's nothing there. CVMFS will not be there. That's not the standard package. You will have to install this first. But we have a tiny script for that. And then we can at least show on a single VM how quickly we can get access to this. Of course, this requires admin privileges. You need to be able to install CVMFS and configure it and mount that file system. Um, if easy is already there, you don't need to do that. Like I did on our cluster, I was just a regular user there. So I can just source the init script and hit, uh, and start running that scientific software. There is another option. I'll get back to these when the VM has spun up. There is another option and that one you can actually try yourself on the prepared environment or if you have a system somewhere where you have either Singularity or Aptainer, you can try this yourself. Um, so this only shows you part of the instructions, but if you click the link to our documentation, this will show you the steps that you have to do. So you have to pre-create some uh, library, uh, some directories. You have to bind mount some paths in there because these locations, this needs to be writable for CVMFS. That's where it's put. It's putting the cache. Um, also, this place needs to be writable. Uh, we're making sure we have an empty home directory. And then you can basically do a singularity shell to shell into our container. So the container we're providing you here, our easy client container, basically only has CVMFS in there. It has no software like OpenFoam or Gromax. Um, so that's, that's just a way to get around not having admin access to install CVMFS. And we're mounting the repository using the fuse mount option of Singularity or Aptainer. So that works absolutely fine. If we copy paste these things, these commands on any system where you have Singularity or Aptainer, it should work. And it should give you a shell like this, where you can then check that CVMFS, uh, the easy CVMFS repository is mounted. You can source the script and try something. Okay, let's see how our VM is doing. And if I can get access to it, it looks like it's running. So, ah, well, it's still initializing, but it should be close. I'll need to figure out where that key is. I think I have it in here somewhere. And I've kicked off a VM in EU West. So that must mean it's Easy EU West, it must be this one. I'll need this identities only. And then the uh, fun part is always what is the username on the VM that you start? I think it's Ubuntu. Yeah, okay. So we're getting access to our empty VM. Ubuntu 22.04. There's no module command here. Absolutely hopeless. There's no easy builds. Uh, yeah, so we have an empty operating system. So what now? What I will do is clone the easy demo repository that we have on GitHub. So we can just git clone this. So all we need is git. That should be easy to install. In here, we have some test scripts for Gromax, OpenFoam, and so on. There's also a scripts directory, which has some installation scripts. And this one is for Ubuntu. 
script, of course. So this is all you need to do to install CVMFS and the, config, the easy configuration for CVMFS. So this whole part is CVMFS. This part is our tiny configuration package, which just installs a configuration file for CVMFS that tells it about the easy repository. Very soon, this will no longer be needed um, because the CVMFS people are asking us to include easy in their default configuration because they, they see the value in this as well. So this part will disappear. And this creates a tiny um, configuration file for CVMFS, where here it says, I'm not using anything special in terms of proxy cache or I'm basically directly connecting to the mirror server, which is not ideal for latency, but it's good enough. And this says you're allowed to use 10 gigabytes of cache. Don't go beyond that. So it's like a, uh, what's it called? As soon as it's long enough ago that you've, you've pulled something in the cache, you, you no longer need it, it will be kicked out. So it recycles, it has a name, I forgot what it was. So I have pseudo writes in this VM, I can just run this script. It will pull in CVMFS, um, which will pull in some dependencies as well. So that's gonna take a minute or two. Uh, but once that's done, um, we can get access to the easy repository and start playing with the software that is there. So you, you can imagine even a researcher could do this, right? If it's only running a single script. So if they're spinning up a VM, you could have a pre-configured VM that has this already installed. Um, so that's what the, the AWS and the Azure people that we are working with are considering. They could give um, pre-baked VM images that are tagged with easy. Um, and that way, uh, all you need to have is CVMFS in there and everything is basically pulled in as you start using it. So that makes it very attractive. It's gonna be a small VM that gives people access to lots of stuff. So that's it. Now let's see, this looks empty. So that looks wrong, but CVMFS does auto mount. So if you actually know what is there and you do less on that, it will mount it. So now it's actually mounting the easy repository. And from here, it's exactly the same as before, latest, in it, bash. Uh, this is some ARM CPU. I'm not sure what, um, and it's a relatively recent month, so it does a little get, gets a little bit confused. But it's basically an ARM Graviton two, at least that's what it detects. And then it does the same thing as before. Does a module use on that, which means we suddenly have Open Foam, Chrome Max, TensorFlow all available. Open Foam, TensorFlow, Chrome Max, the law looks good. So that means we can start. Uh, so now I'm in the TensorFlow directory. There's a run script here, which basically does a module load and runs the Python script. So very, very basic. And this again, when you run it, it's like, come on, let, let's go, right? But it, CVMFS is pulling in all that stuff in the background. Not only the module file, but we're firing a Python. So it has to download that Python binary, all the dependencies for that the Python packages, but you can see it takes a couple of seconds and it starts running TensorFlow. I think it's very difficult to make it easier to get TensorFlow running than, than this. For now, this is CPU only. There's no GPU support yet, but we're working on that. And that will also be possible. Yeah, it's very important, of course. And this you can try yourself. You can, you can in the prepared environment, you should be able to just clone the easy demo repository and run one of these uh, example scripts. And it will, uh, as long as you have set up your environment to use easy with the source command, it should be working fine. If you have obtained it on your local cluster, you can, you can do the same thing as long as you follow um, the instructions here. So this is, let's say the technical details on how to set up your environment and do the singularity shell. If you look into our documentation and the easy container part in here, we actually have a wrapper script as well, which does all that magic for you and drops you into a container that has easy available. So as a scientist, if as long as they have this script, they can just run the script and they can do single node stuff very easily. Any questions on that? 
Yes. Yes, you show you showed us the pipeline where you deploy automatically the um, the new software. Uh, and and one of these steps, which is you said that it's not mentioned here, but it's basically testing. And I'm assuming yeah, that's, that's the reframe tick mark. It, it's there. It's not. We're not yeah. actively doing that yet, but we will. Yeah. So I guess that's functional testing you're referring to. But uh, we could about, also do performance testing in there. Yeah, but what about kind of security aspects? Because you know, if you're taking software from uh, yeah. another kind of uh, unknown built by you that know, could also uh, be done there. That, yeah. yeah. So this this um, approval step here that can be a human that just says okay, right? Well, you can have security scanners in here as well. That first scan the source code that you're pulling in and gonna use for the installation. Yeah, yeah. And there's lots of tools that do this already. They're usually quite cheap. If you're only scanning source code, it's okay. You could even, after the build, rerun the scanners again on the binaries for the check for watermarks and uh, or uh, fingerprints. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely possible. And we'll, yeah, as we'll, we become more and more serious about this, we're, we're, we're gonna do that, of course. And this is a one-time cost, right? So this, you only have to build those binaries once, thoroughly check them, then it's okay. What we will also also do actually, even after stuff is already in the repository, we'll do weekly retests to make sure everything keeps working. Because at some point in, we bring back this guy, um, in the compatibility layer here, there's a glibc that we build ourselves. glibc also has security issues that pop up every now and then. So we will have to update our glibc in here. And we'll have to make sure that doesn't break anything in there. Because glibc is supposed to be dropping replacement, drop and update. In practice, it's not always the case, right? So that's something we're very careful. With. So what we can do is in the in the sandbox environment, do the glibc update and then rerun our test suite and see if something is broken. And that's, that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, I have a couple more slides on what this could enable. If it's um, actually working, it has a bit more software, so there is stuff to play with there. Um, but let's say it's in the, about 100 modules. Eventually, when we have this automation in place, we'll start installing everything that EasyBuild has. Because why not, right? As long as it's open source, we could include all of that in there. And then you have a collection of, let's say, about 3,000 software packages waiting for you to be used. It's like a catalog, and you can just start using them if you think you need them. Uh, so that's the demo. Did I forget something here? Not really. So please give it a try. The, the easiest way to try it is with um, with Singularity or Aptainer. You don't need anything else. If you have Aptainer installed, you can pull in our client container. Um, as long as your environment is set up correctly and you can do single node tests with what is in there in easy, uh, quite easily. So this enables a couple of things that haven't really been possible before. So that interesting things start to happen. So when you give people a uniform software stack that works everywhere, um, there's like new opportunities that arise. And we, we're discussing them also in our open access paper. So uniform access means wide variety of systems. You can run anywhere. Uh, you can play around on your laptop. If you're confident enough that your script works or your input files are well prepared, you can jump to the bigger system uh, with a lot less effort. Your operating system becomes mostly irrelevant. Uh, we can leverage high-speed interconnects like we showed with the Gromax benchmark and so on. And we can actually prepare ourselves. And that's part of the multi xcal project. We can prepare ourselves from for the time that there will be risk 5 CPUs, supercomputers in the future. So that's something you, you, the EU is betting on quite heavily. They want to become um, self-sustaining, essentially. So build their own um, processors and become independent from China. And their risk 5 is, is one way that they will be able to do this. So there's lots of research going on currently. And a small part of the multi x scale project is to see um, how difficult it is to start building binaries for these CPUs already. We can do this in um, with emulation. So we can have an, an emulated uh, VM 
uh, where you're building stuff for risk five, which is going to be quite slow when you're building. But once you have the binary, it should run. You can actually start building the software before the CPUs will be there. Because this is very standardized instruction set and very predictable. You know all the nasty details that you need to know. Um, and we, we, can, uh, we can make this happen. Um, there's lots of software like OpenMPI, like Python, already works fine on RISC-V. So it's, it's starting to get there that it's becoming realistic to, to do this already, even though there's no very capable CPUs yet. Um, like I showed, with auto-detection of the CPUs and building for different generations of CPUs, you can do this without compromising on performance. So very different from what you do with the container image, where you build one binary that works everywhere. And even that is going to slowly start changing. It, one binary that works everywhere works as long as you stick to Intel and AMD. If you go to ARM, it's game over. You have to rebuild your, your, container, your container image. And the same thing with RISC-V. So you will at least have three container images that you need to juggle around. So that's, that's sort of a dead end, at least to me. Um, but in this collaborative software stack, you can build for different generations of CPUs, different families of GPUs. And you can either auto detect or you can tell it which part of the stack it should be using. So that's a very, to me, that's a very large contrast with generic binaries that you typically see in containers. Um, it facilitates cloud bursting as well. So if people have a job and the queue is too long on your on-premise cluster and you have some credits in the cloud, just throw your job into the cloud. And as long as your data is there, um, your software will be there waiting for you. One thing this also enables is using um, Easy NCI environments. That that to me is very interesting. So some scientists are definitely running uh, tests for their code. Like every time they change something in the code, they have some test cases that they run over and over again. Something that's very painful is that that means they have to compile their software, have to make sure all their dependencies are there, have to make sure that the compilers that they want to play with are there. Um, all of that could be coming from Easy, because why not? All you do is mount a file system load modules and things become magically available. They are streamed in um, as they are needed. Um, so all you really need to install is CVMFS as a package. And I showed you how quick that is. And everything else is streamed in as is needed, file by file. So not huge packages of gigabytes that you need to download. Um, and also when in other environments, so in, in Jenkins or GitHub Actions, this is quite typical. But it also enables you to run those same tests on your laptop in the same software environment as well. Now we've actually done this. Um, we actually do this for our, our demos. So for the TensorFlow demo I was running, we're running those tests in, in GitHub Actions as well in a, a workflow um, to basically make sure that our demo script still works and doesn't break. Um, and all we need to do here, and this is very small, we've come up with our own um, GitHub act, or this is uh, no, this is a central GitHub action um, for mounting CVMFS repositories in this environment. So you just tell it, okay, I want to use this. I want to mount the easy pilot repository. The configuration for that can be found at this URL. So this action knows that it should install this package and do the mount of that. And then you're done. You source uh, our init script and you start running your tests. You load modules in those tests and everything just streams in as needed. So it's very, very quick. When you do that, we're doing this in the easy demo environment. I'm not sure if this link will still work because they clean up stuff in there every now and then. But you can see we're running our tests for TensorFlow, OpenFoam, Gromax, and Bioconductor. Um, and we do it twice. I think we do it once with CPU detection and once forcing it to use the generic binaries, just to make sure both of those aspects work. Um, so that's to test our own demo script. We can imagine. Uh, a scientific software developer developing their own code could write tests that just load a bunch of modules for the dependencies or load different modules for different generations of GCC that they want to test with and then make sure that their code keeps working with all of that. So forget about figuring out which RPMs to install. It could all be coming in uh, from easy. So that's at least very different to what's currently possible. Um, that's, another, that's another example where we have our own dedicated action uh, for making easy available in, in GitHub Actions. And there you only need to give it the version that you want to use, everything else it knows. So that's a bit more minimal, but it works just as well. And here, for example, we're loading Gromax and we're checking the version. Works fine. Yeah, 
that and that's that uh, uh, in action. Like I already mentioned, this also facilitates HPC training. So if you are giving a training session on OpenFoam, maybe you want to also explain them how to install OpenFoam, but that's gonna like be day one of the tutorial. I'm not sure you wanna spend your time on that. If you wanna focus on the actual science that they do, you could say for this training, we're gonna use the easy environment because OpenFoam is installed in there. We even have two or three variants of OpenFoam installed in there, so you can pick one. Um, and when they get home, they can try it on their laptop. As long as they mount easy, they can jump to their cluster, send an email to the system and then say, this easy thing, can you please make it available? Because it, it makes my life a lot easier. Um, and they can hit the ground running with the stuff that they learned in the, in the tutorial. Also for the trainers, um, it's very easy. They can set up a Slurm cluster in the cloud. They mount easy. And as long as the software that they need for the tutorial is there, the work is done. When the training is done, you just throw away the cluster and uh, you set it up again for your next training session. So that, that helps a lot compared to making all people that are attending the training get an account on that system and going through the security or whatever, uh, whatever administration is needed to get their account. You just set up your own cluster in Azure or AWS. And there's lots of tools for that, like Cluster in the Cloud or Magic Castle. Uh, and uh, there's parallel cluster for AWS, there's AZ Hub for Azure. So there's, there's lots of tools that allow you to do this quite easily. And integrating easy in there is, is very, very trivial. Like I showed, it's like five or 10 lines of bash. As long as you can figure out how you can make the, the tool do that, you're, you're good to go. This I also briefly mentioned already. Um, we think this could, be a step towards software developers as well. So if someone was asking, are people opening, it was Stefano, I think, are people opening pull requests um, for easy blocks? Um, not really, because easy build, even though many people are using it, it's quite niche. It's just one way of installing the software. But if we have easy and we go talk to the Gromac developers, for example, and say, look, you could maybe add this to your documentation. This is an easy way to get access to uh, Gromax binaries that run anywhere and that are properly tested. That also makes it a platform for them that's maybe more interesting than helping out some random build tool um, that, uh, that only a handful of people are using. Um, so it could alleviate them from many questions on installation. If someone isn't sure, as long as they can figure out how to get easy uh, working, they can get Gromax running and then they should be happy. And that means it's maybe more attractive for developers to actively help out um, validating the installations that we provide. They could figure out, or they could help us figure out which tests we need to run to make sure it's all functional. If we're doing a performance check, they could tell us one nanosecond a day on an Intel Skylake, that seems a bit low, right? So something must be wrong there. Well, we have really no idea. We can say we get a one and we'll try and make sure we keep that one. But if the developers say you should be getting five nanoseconds a day, yeah, that, that helps us as well. And we can, we can figure out what we did wrong. So that, getting that kind of feedback, I think, becomes more interesting from the developer point of view because you'll you're probably be helping a bigger, um, a bigger set of people, of researchers, as long as they use easy. Um, also for the developers themselves, like in the CI case, um, Maybe they can get their dependencies, their compilers that they want to play with from easy, and that, that helps their, uh, their development a bit as well. Another thing is portable workflows. So especially bioinformaticians do a lot of this. They string different tools together in the pipeline, um, and all the tools do something small with their genomic data or whatever they are using. Um, that's all very good, but if you need a 1,000 tools to get your research done, that becomes a bit painful to get all, all those installations in place. If they are a part of easy, a big pain of that goes out the door and they can be running their snake make or next flow or whatever um, on top of easy. That's very different from the, the container approach that some of these tools take. When you're running next flow, you're pulling in containers, which includes a whole bunch of binaries that you're probably never gonna run, right? While with CVMFS, only the stuff that you're actually using is being pulled in. So we're downloading way way less things than you would be downloading full container images. Yeah. All right, so that sort of wraps up all the 
the content I've, I've prepared. There's our open access paper, there's our website. We're still doing a mailing list for easy, which is only used to announce our monthly meetings. Really, there's very, very little activity there. But we do have a very active Slack channel where people jump in all the time um, and uh, ask us some questions. We have documentation, which could definitely be improved, but it's not that bad. We're on GitHub, we have a Twitter account. We have a YouTube channel, just like we do for Easy Build, where we're um, posting any any talks we do, or we had a community meeting last uh, year in September in Amsterdam, where we also explain Easy from scratch in a bit slower pace than I did today, but also talking a bit more in depth about the use cases, talking a bit about um, the bots that we're building and so on. And we have monthly meetings, which are really open to anyone uh, to join. That's what I have in terms of content. Um, yeah, I, I guess so. I think I'm I'm pretty much done in terms of content. So we, we can still handle some questions, of course. But yeah, if you can, I think that makes sense to see if as soon as they can start the coffee break. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the model is that there's a central repository of all the easy software, and then there's all these mirrors. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I mean, potentially, if you have many, many users, you're going to need lots of mirrors. So, who's managing the mirrors? Who's owning the mirrors? Who's paying for the mirrors, the mirror software, the mirrors? For the mirrors, yeah, okay, yeah. that's a good question. Um, so from a naive point of view, it looks like the more mirrors, the better. That's actually not true. So there's like the CVMFS people tell us, go for a dozen mirrors or so spread around the world, but don't do many more than that. Because every time CVMFS starts or, or needs software, it's going to check like, oh, what's my best option here? Which is the close, it does geolocation of the mirror. So based on the IP address, it figures out which one is the closest one it should be talking to, to minimize the the latency and the delay in, in downloading stuff. The more options it has to choose to, the more things it needs to ping to see if they're still alive and it's actually going to slow things down. So we're looking at the order of like a dozen or so mirrors. Um, and what, what we envision is that the, the let's say the maintainers of the project um, also maintain the mirrors, at least the public mirrors. Because then if something goes wrong with the mirror, if it's somehow not syncing anymore, that would be bad because that means new software is not streaming in there if you're coming in through that. So we're looking at a at like say a core team of how many maintainers we will need um, that also keep an eye on those mirrors, set up monitoring, and make sure everything works as expected. So we think like let's say ten a dozen mirrors, couple in the US, several in Europe, one in Australia, one in Asia to be close to those people if they want to use it as well. But the focus is going to be on Europe probably, um, and that that should be enough. Yeah. So there will be a team managing that. There's um um. As a part of the multi x scale project, there's the idea of setting up a, a rotation among five or six of the partners that are involved in, in the technical parts of the of the project. So they will be keeping an eye on, on the mirrors. They also, we're also set up a support portal for easy where people can ask questions or say, I tried running this and it didn't work. And then we can either figure out, is it a problem with the system? Is it a problem with easy? So we need to talk to the software developers, like pull in the right people and, and try to figure out what's going on and, and make it possible. Um, one thing I didn't mention, which is also interesting, the ones I'm showing here are like the public mirrors, so the, which are part of the easy network, let's say. Um, if you install our easy configuration package, those are the mirrors that CFMFS will know about. You can install your own mirror server as well. You don't have to ask anyone. It's all documented on how to do this. You could put it next to your HPC cluster in the same network, so you're reducing the latency, and that will automatically sync with uh, the public servers of the network. So that's like your own mirror only for your use case, and that will not be serving anyone else. So as long as you do that and you maintain your own, absolutely fine. Yeah. So that's just one or maybe two more servers that you add to the list in the configuration, and then CVMFS will also ping them, but not all the other ones that people have at their own cluster. So you can, in your network, you can, uh, and that helps as well because maybe your, your cluster nodes don't have access to the, to the web. 
So they could be offline. As long as your, your mirror server is in the HPC network and they can ping that, that's actually okay. That's all you need because your mirror server has a full copy of everything. Another thing, a full copy sounds scary. That sounds huge, right? Maybe hundreds of terabytes, yeah, not at all. So what Compute Canada does is they have thousands of software packages installed. And last time I checked, they were still under a terabyte of disk space with CVMFS because CVMFS does deduplication. It will never store the same binary twice. So it has object storage in the backend. It's like Git where all these hashes and so it has only the every file once on the on the disk. And it also does compression on disk and, and when sending the data over the network. So Compute Canada can, can serve all the software, all the scientific software that the researchers need across the whole of Canada with a terabyte of disk. So yeah, setting up a mirror server is not that scary in terms of resources you need. It could be a, a two or four core VM with one or two terabyte of, of SSD disk, and you're good. Oh yeah, coffee, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't need, no, no, and I guess, no, but I don't think we need to ask for more. No? I'm happy to take more questions, but other than that, it's sort of a wrap, right? Um, so it's it's up to you if you can, uh, if you're ready for the weekend. I'm totally fine with that. I'm also happy to answer any any questions or show you something more specific, more technical. Uh, up to you. So yeah, if you can, I would say take a look, play around with it, maybe on a VM, maybe through the container and just see if it doesn't work for you, we'd really like to hear from you um, because now, now is the time. That's also clear in our documentation. So we're, whenever we talk about using easy, there's a big fat warning here, right? So this is not ready for production. Our, our pilot setup is you can play with it and there have been very little instances where it doesn't work, but please don't make this the only software that you provide on your cluster today. That, we don't have strong guarantees there. We're going to move to a different domain. We're going to make it easy.io. It becomes a bit more neutral, not HPC specific, because we're going to rebuild our CVMFS network with dedicated hardware that's securely set up with YubiKey, so only a couple of people can can access it and stuff like this. So, and we're going through that exercise now. Um, once we do that, and once we have the automation in place with the bot to set up that whole contribution workflow. Then we'll start saying, okay, now we think you can start relying on this and, and assume this will work. Today, not yet. But I think by the end of this year, we'll be a lot closer to that, if not already there. So that's an explicit goal in the first year of the multi X scale project is making easy, ready for production, which means it's stable, it's properly set up. And from that point on, we'll start expanding with more and more software testing. Uh, making noise about it, attracting attention, getting developers involved, and so on. Okay. If there's no more questions, I'll I'll stop the recording. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah, thank you.